the Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Chandler, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? With the, the proposal is supported. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. And I call uh, Senator Chandler to move the motion. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Acti uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move the motion circulated in my name. And I rise to speak on this motion regarding the urgent need for Australia to provide more assistance to the Ukraine government. We have all seen the horrific human impact of Russia's invasion. We have all seen clear evidence of war crimes, both against Ukrainian soldiers and the civilian population. We have seen the deliberate bombing of civilian residences, hospitals, power infrastructure and other non-military targets in tactics designed to inflict suffering and death on the Ukrainian population. And it is plain that defeating Russia's invasion is, not, is critical not only for Ukraine, but also for the rest of the world. Putin must not be allowed to send a message to his fellow authoritarian leaders that they can invade any neighbouring country and obtain victory, particularly if that victory comes through an unwillingness of the West to do what needs to be done to defeat Russia's aggression, an aggression which will only grow if they are successful in defeating Ukraine. At the outset of Russia's invasion, Australia was at the forefront of providing assistance to the people of Ukraine. Under the former coalition government, Australia was one of the earliest and biggest non-NATO contributors to Ukraine. Our support covered assistance across humanitarian, military, energy and visas and included $285 million in military assistance. $65 million in humanitarian assistance, funding to NATO's trust fund for Ukraine to support non-lethal military equipment and medical supplies, the delivery of 60 pallets of medical supplies donated by Australians to the Ukrainian government, along with three pallets of radiation monitoring equipment and personal protective equipment. We gave priority to family stream visa applications from Ukrainian nationals and established a new temporary humanitarian visa to Ukrainians in arriving in Australia, which enabled them to study, work and access Medicare while here. Since February, more than 9,500 visas have been granted to Ukrainians to come to Australia. And we provided funding to a range of NGOs and community groups to support the provision of aid, donations and support to the refugees and citizens of Ukraine. But now, Madam Acting Deputy President, we have a situation where Australia has dramatically slipped down the list of nations providing assistance to Ukraine. This situation cannot be more urgent. For months, the Ukrainian government has been pleading for vital military equipment and resources to support its counter-offensive. They have made a series of specific requests of Australia for equipment which could help the Ukrainians to make decisive ground in their battle against Russia. And these requests are within our capacity to have met. Yet at the recent Senate estimates just a couple of weeks ago, key departments, including the Department of Defence and the Department of Foreign Affairs, have stated that there is no provision at all in their budgets for additional support to Ukraine. It seems that assistance to Ukraine is caught up in the same situation as the rest of our defence budget, with the Albanese government demanding cuts in defence to pay for other priorities. We urge the swift announcement of a new and comprehensive package of Australian military, humanitarian and energy assistance to Ukraine, underpinned by thorough consideration of the Ukrainian government's specific requests, including for Hawkeyes, M1 Abrams tanks, F-18 Hornets and demining equipment and detectors. If for some reason these capabilities cannot be made available to the Ukrainian government, then we urge this government to explain today to the Senate why not and provide an alternative package of support. I don't think it is any surprise to anybody listening along to this debate at home that Ukraine cannot wait for this assistance. They cannot wait for a media announcement, time to coincide with a 
my ministerial visit or the government's media schedule. They need a commitment now, and they need that commitment followed by swift delivery. So I urge the government speakers today to provide clarity on when our next package of assistance to Ukraine will be announced and to guarantee that what we in Australia are doing is whatever is necessary to meet the requests that Ukraine has made. Senator Billick. Thank you. As the chair of the Australian-Ukraine Parliamentary Friendship Group and also as a member of the Australian-Ukraine community, it would be of little surprise to people in this place that I've had a lot of involvement with the Ukrainian community well before Russia's illegal full-scale invasion started. I also have regular meetings with the co-chairs of the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations, Stefan Romanu, OAM, and Katerina Agarou, and the Ambassador of Ukraine to Australia, His Excellency Vassil Maroshnychenko. They are grateful for all the support Australia has given under both the previous and the current government, military, humanitarian and moral. And the approach to the ongoing crisis has, until recently, been bipartisan, in fact, supported by the whole parliament. As a matter of principle, the global community, including Australia, cannot stand idly by while a sovereign nation is subjected to an illegal, immoral and unprovoked invasion. By flouting the rules-based order that has maintained relative global peace and security since the end of World War II, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is an attack on all sovereign countries. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to the Ukrainian people for the extraordinary courage and resolve they have shown, because by fighting to uphold this rules-based order, they fight for all of us. Since coming to government, Labor has continued the previous government's policy of providing military assistance to Ukraine, while continuing to maintain the capability to defend our own nation if necessary. And our support to date includes 50 Bushmaster armoured vehicles in addition to the 40 committed under the previous government, more armoured vehicles, demining equipment to help remove explosive ordnance from the battlefield, $33 million in uncrewed aerial systems and sending 70 Australian Defence Force personnel to take part in Operation Kudu for the training of Ukrainian forces. The commitments made by this government bring Australia's total contribution in military, humanitarian other and other assistance to over $680 million. And we do remain one of the world's largest contributors to Ukraine outside of NATO. The material assistance we have given to Ukraine is backed up by costs imposed on Russia to deter and disrupt their illegal actions. Australia has now imposed more than 1,100 sanctions on Russia, including targeted financial sanctions and travel bans on 90 individuals and 40 entities. Our sanctions ban the import of Russian oil, refined petroleum products, coal, gas and gold, and the export to Russia of alumina, bauxite and luxury goods, including wine and cosmetics. The Australian government has directed Export Finance Australia to reject any requests for loans or other finance that support trade with or investment in Russia or Belarus. And of course, we continue to talk to the government of Ukraine and give careful consideration to all requests for assistance. We will continue to, all, to do all we can to assist Ukraine for as long as it takes. In fact, the Deputy Prime Minister has indicated that we will have another iteration of support for Ukraine, and this will be announced when the details are finalised. Throughout the course of the war in Ukraine, I have made it my practice not to politicise the issue of assistance for Ukraine, and I strongly encourage other senators to take the same approach on both sides of the chamber. And the reason I've taken this approach is because I strongly believe that in my argument over Ukraine, rather than that the united fronts we've so far seen, either nationally or globally, undermines the unity and strength of resolve that we demonstrate to the world and to Russia. Continuing the spirit of bipartisanship sends a strong message to Russia that we as a parliament, regardless of who is in government, are united and unwavering in our resolve to condemn and oppose Russia's actions and to help Ukraine achieve victory. Just like when we all stood together in the House of Representatives chamber, shoulder to shoulder with Ambassador Miroshnichenko, one year after Russia's full-scale invasion, in a show of solidarity with Ukraine. Perhaps the, the opposition, if they wish to sow their support for Ukraine, could address LNP backbenchers who throw insults at the Ukrainian leader on the floor of the Senate and flirt with Russian disinformation in podcast interviews. As such, 
I invite those opposite to reflect on whether the urgency motion they have put forward now and their contributions to the debate on this motion are a helpful contribution to the effort to assist Ukraine. Because politicising this issue, doing anything that undermines the spirit of bipartisanship that has continued up until this point, does not serve Australia's interests, nor does it serve Ukraine's interests. Shame on you. Senator Steele John. Thank you. Let us ground this debate in the reality that 481 days have passed since Russia's illegal and immoral invasion of Ukraine. 481 days in which the Ukrainian people have confronted the most terrible violence at the hands of the Russian war machine. 481 days in which they have been subject to war crimes. 481 days in which they have been subject to the taking of their children. 481 days in which they have gone to sleep not knowing, many of them, whether their homes would stand in the morning, whether their sons and daughters would still be alive, whether their nation would endure. Well, for 481 days, the Ukrainian nation has endured. The Ukrainian nation continues. The Ukrainian nation pushes back. And as we gather as a Senate this evening, we are entering the third week of the Ukrainian counteroffensive in the East. The fighting is intense, most intense, according to the UK Department of Defence, around the Zapranitsa and Donetsk oblasts and around Bakhmut. As towns are liberated in fierce fighting, what is revealed is the ruin of homes and of communities, places that will require incredible amounts of work to rebuild, people who will require and need so much support to heal. And so as we consider as a Senate what more the Australian government could do in order to lend assistance to the nation of Ukraine, what more the Australian government could do to put tangible action behind its words of solidarity, I once again urge the government to look at the real need for an international program of debt relief for Ukraine. The Ukrainian nation, once it is victorious on the battlefield, cannot be expected to rebuild and to heal while paying back the incredible sums of money that have been required to finance this effort. We would be doing the people of Ukraine a great disservice if, as the ticker tape of the victory parade fades, we abandon them to a life in the shadow of debt and austerity. We must work internationally to bring together global nations for this program of debt relief so that peace can truly follow victory. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to support this motion regarding support to Ukraine, and uh, I welcome the call for bipartisanship. And uh, I note that we have very enthusiastically welcomed any uh, announcements of support, including the sanctions and things that the government has given uh, to the effort to defeat a totalitarian regime, which uh, shamefully, uh, despite being on the Security Council and supposedly upholding the global rules-based order and uh, security for smaller nations has illegally invaded their neighbour to impose their will. The problem we have is that we want to do more barracking and supporting the government, and we're looking for more decisions to provide support. Uh, even the ABC fact check has called out the Prime Minister for continuing to claim uh, that Australia is the largest non-NATO contributor when that fact uh, is no longer true and hasn't been for some time because of the decreasing uh, levels of support. Uh, so we would welcome the opportunity to celebrate and cheer more support from the government, uh, but given the fact that there is an offensive to liberate uh, the eastern parts of Ukraine underway as we speak, uh, that needs to occur sooner rather than later. 
The other things that um, I think are important in this area is for the government to do all it can to get other stakeholders and interlocutors in the global affairs to use whatever influence they have over the Putin regime uh, to get them to withdraw uh, from Ukraine and to respect sovereignty, and in particular the government of President Xi Jinping uh, in China, uh, who has a all-in, no-holds relationship with the Putin regime, I would encourage them to use whatever influence they have to get a better outcome. But to some particular measures that I think the government can make a decision on today, uh, during estimates, the Department of Foreign Affairs was talking about their emergency humanitarian fund, and uh, as we explored that fund, it uh, was confirmed that they have $12.9 million uncommitted in that fund. At the same time, we see reports coming out of Ukraine, and two reports in particular I'd like to refer to by Save the Children, highlight that as of April, over 500 children have been confirmed as being killed in Ukraine since Russia's unjustified and illegal invasion. And over 900, nearly 1,000, uh, are confirmed to have been injured, and that it is feared that those numbers are actually much greater. There are mine incidents daily in Ukraine, and one in eight casualties from mine incidents, from landmines, are children. The other thing to be aware of is that there are 17,000-odd people that have been affected after the damage to the dam by the flooding that's occurred around the Dnipro River. And we're all used in Australia to the issue of floods and the damage it causes and disease and impacts. But the unique part here is as those waters have raced through the lands, they have unearthed landmines, and now there is this scattering of landmines throughout that flood plain, uh, which affect uh, communities and particularly children uh, in those areas. And so for this $12.9 million, uh, there is an Australian capability, a group called MindLab, who make the world's most advanced mine detection system, the MDS-10, which is used by the American Department of Defence. It's also used by NGOs such as the Halo Trust, who conduct uh, mine clearing operations uh, in conflict zones uh, worldwide. And there is an opportunity in the last eight or so days before the end of the financial year, in terms of working days, for the government to commit that $12.9 million that is uncommitted in the Emergency Humanitarian Fund. And if there was ever a cause, which is an emergency humanitarian need, both from the flooding but particularly the mine uh, characteristics, where we could be saving the lives of innocent men, women and children, it is the provision of demining equipment uh, as well as training to the Ukrainian government, to their society, as well as to international groups that are supporting work there. And so, quite apart from the military announcements that we are looking for, including the 41 Hornets, which I think should be delivered, uh, particularly with American support around spares and maintenance, but there is no reason why that $12.9 million can't be committed right now to provide demining equipment for the children of Ukraine. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Senator White. Uh, Acting De Deputy President, the government opposes this urgency motion. This is based on our record of support for Ukraine and the concern we have about the motivations of the coalition who are seeking to politicise foreign policy for, sh for cheap political gain. Firstly, I want to put on record uh, in this place my support for Ukraine in its fight against Rus Russian oppression. For nearly 16 months, the Ukrainian people have been uh, locked in a gruelling war they did not start and which has taken so much from them. I'm proud to, proud to stand with Ukraine and its, uh, as it defends its people, its territory and its sovereignty. After the bleak consequences of both the Second World War and the Cold War in the 20th century, we're now seeing the reality of another full-scale invasion in Europe. This is a reality, reality I find disheartening and shocking. I don't really like talking about war in this place, 
I do not wish to condone it or to pretend that I agree it is ever permissible. However, I acknowledge that sometimes in life we must pick sides. The people of Ukraine have no choice but to defend themselves against unprovoked aggression from the Russian state. And on that basis, we in this place must support the efforts of Ukraine to protect themselves. In that vein, I also want to make mention of the efforts in advocating for Ukraine of my colleague and friend, Senator Billick. Senator Billick has a personal connection to Ukraine, as she's spoken of today. And since the beginning of the war, she has worked to publicise the efforts of the Ukrainian people in defending their lands. I thank her for her leadership in this place on Ukraine. Acting Deputy President, I want to step out the support that the Australian government, particularly the Labor government, has provided to the people and government of Ukraine since the invasion began. In my view, that support has been significant. In military terms, Australia has remained one of the largest contributors, both within our region and as a country that is non as a non-NATO member. In, in fact, our government has nearly doubled the dollar amount spent in military support for Ukraine. We have spent over $680 million since we took office in May last year. We have provided 90 Bushmasters, a number of armoured vehicles, explosive removal equipment, ADF personnel to help train Ukrainian troops in, in the UK. United Kingdom to name some of the, the initiatives. Ukraine cannot win the war against Russia without military equipment and the government acknowledge that, uh, acknowledges that difficult fact. The humani humanitarian response of the Australian government is also an important uh, aspect of our uh, support of Ukraine. We are extending immigration support and access to social safety nets for Ukrainian nationals in Australia and Ukrainians seeking to come here fleeing war zones and violence. This sort of humanitarian and practical administrative help for those fleeing the terror of war is really important because it contributes to the safety of Ukrainian citizens and ma maintains important links between Australia, Australia's Ukrainian community and their family and friends back home. Lastly, the government has taken serious action on making sure the Russian state and Russian economy does not profit from the war in Ukraine and to press those financing the illegal invasion to stop pouring money into it. Senator Billig detailed this, these uh, measures in great detail, but I remind you that th there, are, there are more than 1,100 targeted financial sanctions and trade sanctions on key Russian individuals and industries that uh, uh, look to has put sanctions on the importation of Russian oil, gold, coal, gas and gold. All of this military, humanitarian, diplomatic and economic F F support provided to Ukraine shows that the Australian government is committed to maintaining and reinforcing the international rules-based order, a system which represents the best shot we have at avoiding war and preserving peace. Russia needs to be, Russia needs to be held to account. The illegal invasion of another country undertaken in the way Russia invaded Ukraine is not acceptable. This should, this should always be the case. It's also worth pointing out that until recently the question of government support for Ukraine was a bipartisan and non-politicised uh, question. However, I must acknowledge that even me standing here to debate an urgency motion raised by Senator Chandler represents the latest desperate attempt by the coalition to pol politicise important matters of foreign policy. Uh, I, finally, I say I'm proud of the government's record of support for Ukraine and I stand with Ukraine. Thank you, Senator White. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and I thank you for the opportunity to debate this important urgency motion. I'm proud to stand and speak as a representative of members of my community, including Canberran Ukrainians that are seeking additional support for Ukraine. Here are the words of my constituent, Andrew Lezinski. To quote, the Ukrainian community here is still outraged about the invasion. Ukraine is a sovereign nation that is grimly defending that sovereignty. The Ukrainian community here and all over Australia and the rest of the world continue to protest this Russian aggression and will continue to do so whilst Russian forces are in Ukraine. Ukraine is determined to defend all things Ukrainian and the world is showing massive support because this is simply wrong. Putin will lose and U Ukraine will prevail. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting, uh, Acting Madam, Madam Deputy President. Last week I met with a Ukrainian ambassador. He told me the Ukrainians are very grateful for the support they have already received from the government and the Australian people. 
The government has supplied Bushmasters ammunition and the ADF is involved in training Ukrainian troops in the United Kingdom. While grateful, the ambassador assured me that there is a real and desperate need for more help right now, not tomorrow. Their counteroffensive is on and the Ukrainians are fighting hard, but I can tell you with heavy losses of life every day. When the Prime Minister announced the package for Ukraine last year, he said that Australian support for Ukraine will continue, and I quote, for as long as it takes for Ukraine to emerge victorious. I've got the perfect date for the government to mount more help for Ukrainians, including the 90 Hawkeyes and more Bushmasters. That date is August 24, Ukraine's Day of Independence. I have to say this, stop going in half pregnant and give it everything you've got, because I can tell you it's the only way you are going to give those Ukrainians a fighting chance to win this war. No more half pregnancy. Get in there and go hard. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak in, por in, in support of this important urgency motion, and I commend uh, Senator Chandler for this motion and this initiative. For months now, need has been mounting for this Labor government to deliver a further package of military, humanitarian and energy assistance to Ukraine, something that has, has and continues to be overwhelmingly supported by the Australian people. It is time now for less spin and more action, which would be incredibly welcomed by Australians. And in the spirit of bipartisanship and also drawing on my own background, I've been working very closely with the Ukrainian ambassador uh, and Australian demining experts to prepare an options paper for the ambassador and for the Australian government on what Australia can do to assist Ukraine with demining and also with mine action. It is a modest but an incredibly meaningful and important package one that can save so many civilian lives now and well into the future. And the need is absolutely great and it is urgent and it will be ongoing. Since the start of the Russia-Ukraine war in early 2014, Russia has used a wide range of explosive ordnance throughout Ukraine, including mine, cluster munitions, booby traps, mortars, artillery, rockets and missiles. And they're also now using improvised explosive devices aimed at women and children. You know, they're rigged up in houses, in streets and even in children's toys. Ukraine is now the most mined country in the world and, unsurprisingly, demining is now the third most important issue for Ukrainians after shelling and also family reunions. The UNDP estimates that nearly 15 million Ukrainians are impacted by landmines and other explosive ordnance. It's estimated now that 30 per cent of this very large nation has been contaminated with land mines, which, to put in perspective, is half the size of Japan or Italy. Now, while Ukrainian uh, explosive ordnance disposal and combat engineer personnel are very capable, there are simply not enough of them to meet the competing demands of combat operational support and humanitarian mine clearance. Um, which are also, the humanitarian assistance is also very ably assisted, as Senator Fawcett has said, through organisations such as the UNDP and also the HALO Trust. So essentially there are two types of mine action responses desperately needed to be supported in, the, in Ukraine. Firstly, combat or operational uh, demining or mine clearance, which is conducted by uniformed service personnel within the combat zone itself. Secondly is humanitarian mine action, which covers uh, su surveys, clearances, risk education for civilians and also victim assistance. And here in Australia, we can provide both. We are incredibly, sadly, uh, experienced in both. Now, Australia has also is home to specialist technologies and businesses such as Mine Lab and uh, Gap Explosive Ordnance Detection, who are already supporting the Ukrainian humanitarian mine action. But so much more could be done. We have extensive military and civilian experience in humanitarian mine action and also combat demining. The ADF has supported uh, for many, many years demining efforts in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Cambodia and Mozambique. And many of our retired, highly trained ex-ADF personnel have gone on and continue to support and often lead these missions around the world. I firmly believe, and this was in my proposal, that Australia should be providing a skilled training team to deliver basic counter explosive hazards, high risk engineer search and explosive ordnance disposal training to uh, Ukrainian armed forces. And I propose that this could and should be conducted as part of the third rotation 
of Operation Kudu, which is training delivered in the United Kingdom. We have the capacity, we have the experience, we have uh, the materiel, we have the equipment, uh, all to do this and provide this support to tomorrow. Now, the ambassador did write last month to the defence minister, Richard Miles, uh, asking for practical demining assistance uh, that had been outlined in this paper. But yet, a month later, he still has not heard back, and uh, neither have I. And in that spirit of bipartisanship, I think it is time for the government to start acting and supporting practical, meaningful um, things that can save so many lives in Ukraine and work in con conjunction with so many other nations. So the time is now for the Labor government to act. Have a look at the proposal and tell us what are they going to do in conjunction with everything else my colleagues have talked about today. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Reynolds. The time for the debate is, has expired. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by me, Senator Chandler, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents.